seconds. Good morning. Our numbers are way down today, but we sort of anticipated that, didn't we? But it's good to see you all. Bonnie and I have been gone for a couple of weeks, gone one week, and of course none of us were here last Sunday, but it's uh, such a blessing to be back in here, isn't it? Amen. And we just need to continue to pray that things get better uh, for us and for the whole country and uh, we can ultimately get back to a, a way things should be. We do have a number of people on our prayer list that we want to mention and uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of these. Um, I'll mention Tyler Sutton first. Of course, he was moved to another place uh, part of the Shepherd Center's uh, facilities, but still it's a, a place where he can get more rehab and in time have more visitors. He does get to have some family come in there, there now, and uh, we just pray that he continues to get better and better and uh, even be able to come home maybe in December. Of course, with him, we want to remember Autumn and Brady, their child, uh, on the way. and. Uh, as well as their child on the way, Sean, Mallory, Faye, of course, and the rest of the family. Let's remember Kay Smith. Uh, she's had the COVID. She's, she's doing better, uh, but with the conditions, uh, her own uh, health conditions, uh, uh, underlying conditions, this makes it especially difficult for her, but uh, she is doing better. She has a lot of congestion, that sort of thing, a headache she's been dealing with, so please continue to remember her. Uh, Chad, I think, also has some symptoms of it. So that family has been hit pretty hard, and uh, uh, other extended members of the family. Uh, please remember any that you know of who are suffering from this virus. Diane Smith's cousin on her mother's side, Luke, he's had it, but he's doing better. He's been home now uh, for several days, so uh, they've given him some new kind of drugs that, that's making him do better. So we're glad for that. Uh, perhaps there's some I'm going to overlook, and I apologize for that, but it was mentioned on ACOC about Michael Morris, uh, the grandfather of Morgan and Madison Sutton, who died a few days ago. We certainly want to remember that family. <laughs> More on a good news note, Nathan and uh, Lee Woodring uh, had their baby, uh, Addie Mae, born last Tuesday, weighed seven pounds, was 18 inches long, and I know Terry and Jackie are really excited about that, and I, I'm thinking they're away visiting with their grandbaby now. <coughs> Also, very good news, and uh, we'll end with this, we're supposed to close on the land this Tuesday. That's been a long time coming. Uh, it's not Tuesday yet, it's not done yet, so pray that that goes through. Just pray that, that uh, nothing happens to change that and we can finally be rid of this land. Let's take a songbook out. We're glad to have Graham Smith here with us this morning as well as all of you, but Graham's going to be leading us in our song service today. Good morning. Turn over to number 585. 585. First, second, and fifth verses. Soldier of Christ, so
or 730. Number 730. So the first and last verses. John chapter 8, John chapter 8, beginning in verse number 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go. But ye, ye cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh. I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. That's the scripture reading. Now let's have the opening prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day. We thank you for the rain that you sent our way. Father, we pray for all those that have come this day to worship you in truth and in spirit, whether they are in this building or in the parking lot or later worship online. Father, we, we pray for strength in these difficult days where we've been attacked by a wicked virus that was not our own doing. We pray as cases in our county decrease that our numbers in worship will increase. Father, we pray for those that hopefully uh, haven't become indifferent <coughs> But if they have, Father, we pray that just as the brother read this morning, Jesus is the light of the world. <clears throat> he is our only hope. And Father, we know that 
you have designed and commanded worship for us to honor and praise thee to remember our Lord's death at Calvary to come and study your word as we meet together in fellowship being in one mind in one body that is the precious church or body of Christ Father, your design, your, your commandment was for a purpose. May we understand that when we worship together, we are strengthened. We encourage or edify one another. And of all, Father, we are strengthened by you, your precious word. Father, may we be reminded of Paul's letter to Timothy. As he encourages him, Father, to not back up. Don't go back. Don't go back into the circumcision. The gospel of Christ is what keeps us to this very day. Father, we pray your blessing upon all those that have been mentioned that are sick. We pray for, for those who have COVID. We pray for Tyler as he is working to recover. I know he's working hard, Father, from his accident. We ask a special blessing upon him, his wife, little Brady, and their son who is to be born soon. Please comfort and strengthen that family. Please help Sean and Mallory, Faye, Sabrina, and all the other family members that have been affected by this event. We pray for strength for them. Father, please help, help Kay as she's fighting COVID. We thank you for the progress that she's made and we pray that she will continue to do so. We pray for Kevin who's traveling today to Arkansas to speak to the church there and talk to them about church security and of course the gospel of Christ. Father, we pray for Rick and his family as they help lead us through these days. Father, we know that Jesus' light shines brightly. May we stand in his light. And even though sometimes we think the little light that we hold up on his behalf is insignificant, may we understand, Father, it is not insignificant. May we be encouraged by the study of your word. May we know that we cannot lose when we remain in you. Please be with us. May we worship you and in spirit and in truth. May the things that we say and do always line up directly with your word. And may we never substitute our opinions or others for your word. Oh, we thank you for Jesus, and it's his precious name, our Savior. We pray these things. Amen. To help prepare our minds for the Lord's up this morning, let's we'll sing them 359. <clears throat> Three hundred and fifty. 
59. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verses. First, second, and fourth verses. Jesus King Matthew chapter 27, verse 39. Matthew 27, 39. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. Now, this scene depicts people coming out of Jerusalem. I would imagine many of them on their way home after celebrating the Passover and where Jesus was hanging on the cross was just outside the city gates, and so these people had to come by. And as they would pass by Jesus, seeing him hanging on the cross, they took the time to stop and yell abuses at him, vile language to curse him, to wag their heads, and to say, in effect, you, you said you'd destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Ha! If you can do that, save yourself. That's the implication of what they were saying. They wanted him to do a miracle 
while he was living and uh, to prove that he was the Messiah. And so they took the time to uh, hurl these abuses at him. And I imagine they took great delight in that. But what we need to understand is these people were lied to by the religious leaders. In John 2.19 is where Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. And you know when he said that, he wasn't talking about the temple in Jerusalem. He was talking about his body. Amen. He was talking about the fact that he was going to be put to death, but in three days he would be resurrected. And so the people were lied to about Jesus. And as a result, as they passed by, they sneered at him. They curled their lips, yelled with abuses at him. And here's what I want us to think about. How do you suppose that made Jesus feel? He was already feeling excruciating physical pain. But how do you think he felt emotionally? Well, the, the psalmist tells us in Psalm 22, verses 6 and 7, he tells us in these prophetic words, this is Jesus' own words, if you will, Psalm 22, 6 and 7, but I am a worm and not a man. A reproach it is a disappointment and despised, hated by the people. All who see me sneer at me and separate with the lip and wag their head. And that prophetic statement came true, didn't it? That's what the people did as they passed by. And so as we eat the Lord's Supper today, I want us to think about the abject humiliation that Jesus felt as he died on the cross for us. He felt like a worm, not even a man. As one who was despised misunderstood and repulsed by the people. Let's give thanks. Dear Father, what a blessed opportunity this is to come together these many years, decades, centuries after that awful day when your son hung on the cross for our sins. And in addition to feeling the excruciating pain from the nails, the thorns, the spear that was thrust through his side, you don't often think about the humiliated feeling he had of being misunderstood, despised, repulsed by the people. We know, Father, he was willing to go through that for us. And so at this time, we give thanks for this bread which represents his body, which was given in our stead. Bless us as we partake. In Jesus' name. Give thanks for through the vine. Father, none of us want to be 
misunderstood and lied about and uh, dis be a disappointment to people. <clears throat> None of us want to be despised. Be, be made to feel in, not even like a man or a woman, but a, a worm. We can't hardly imagine that. But this was apparently the way your son felt as he hung on that cross and for all that he went through, we give thanks. This time we give thanks for the blood that was shed in our, in our behalf. That blood that uh, cleanses us from all of our sins. We're so thankful for the gospel. The privilege we've had of obeying it. May we continue to walk in the light as he is in the light. Knowing that the blood cleanses us, continues to cleanse us from all of our sins. Think about this. Bless us as we partake of this fruit of the vine. In Jesus' name. use this time also to think about uh, the many material blessings that we have and if you haven't already done so on your way out of the building this morning you can uh, lay by in stores the Bible teaches us giving what you can uh, for the work here to continue on let's give thanks father indeed we are blessed materially in spite of the difficulties that we're having to deal with with this pandemic, we do thank you, Father, that uh, we're able to provide for ourselves. We pray for others who are having a harder time that we can do what we can to help them in any way. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and for every good and perfect gift that comes from your hand pray that we'll use these gifts and give what we can liberally and without grudging, being cheerful in the ability to give, and that we can use these in the way that will uh, advance your kingdom. Bless us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Mark any song books, number 924. Oh, God. 
Well, we're certainly glad that you are here today. Our number may be a little bit smaller than normal, but I'm still thankful that we're able to meet in person. Uh, it's still better than having uh, everybody in the parking lot or uh, online worshiping. I'm thankful that you are here, of course. Uh, if you are sick, we want you to stay home, or if you're worried about getting sick, we want you to stay home or stay in your car and worship in the parking lot, but we are so glad that you are here today. You know, I finally had to do something that I've been dreading for some time recently, and that is order me some bifocals. <laughs> I'm at that age now where I can't really read up close with my glasses on. I have to take them off to see what's going on uh, close up. And it just reminds me that uh, things change as you age. You know, one of the things that I hear older people talking about is their eyesight dimming through the years. You know, those of us that are born blessed with the uh, ability of sight, it's hard for us to imagine what it would be like to be born into a world of darkness, isn't it? Uh, not ever being able to see any colors or to try to have somebody describe different colors to you. Uh, it almost boggles the mind. Almost impossible. So I'm thankful that we have light in the world. And I'm thankful that we're able to perceive the light in the world around us. You know, as we read in our scripture reading today in John chapter 8 and verse number 12... Jesus spake again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but he shall have the light of life. You know, there are a number of characteristics that light has that we benefit from. And I think that Jesus here is using light as an illustration, of course, of spiritual things. It's not surprising that Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 2 about a great light that would come into the world. John the Baptist came to bear witness to the light, John 1, verses 6 and 7. And John the Apostle calls Jesus the light of life, John 1, verses 1 through 5. Let's talk about some of the qualities of physical light compared with some of the qualities of Jesus as the spiritual light of the world. Number one, light reveals things to us that we couldn't normally perceive. And Jesus is a great revealing light to us, isn't he? You think about all the things that we wouldn't know about except it were for Jesus. Think about how Jesus, for instance, revealed to us the true nature of God. You know, the Old Testament teaches us quite a bit about God. It teaches us about his great power, his creative power. It teaches us about his care for mankind and about how concerned he was when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and set the motion of salvation into, uh, into process. But it wasn't really revealed to us the true nature of God until it was revealed in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 6. Listen to this passage. And it, uh, as I studied for this lesson, this verse really jumped out at me in a way that it never had before. For God who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. If it, weren't for, if it weren't for Jesus Christ and for the life that he lived, we really could not perceive the true glory of God. Amen. This is why, of course, in John chapter 14, Philip said unto Jesus, Show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Can you imagine one of Jesus' best and closest friends one of the twelve coming to Jesus and said, after all you've done, after all the miracles, after all the things that we've seen and all the preaching that we heard, 
One thing will satisfy us. Show us the Father. Steve talked about how Jesus must have felt on the cross. How must this have, uh, statement have made Jesus feel? He went on to say there, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet, yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Jesus, Jesus must have been very disappointed with his, uh, with his disciples here, realizing that they had the glory of God there with them in the flesh. Jesus Christ revealed the glory of the Father. The light of Jesus also shows us the mind of God through the Scriptures. Just as his life revealed the glory of God, his word reveals to us the mind of God. You know, before he came in the flesh, he was called the word of God, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. So Jesus was the word. And the word, Jesus, had a part in both physical and spiritual creation. Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 16, the Bible says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Amen. You keep reading there, you'll find out that Jesus is the head of the church. And so, not only did he create everything in the physical realm, but he also built his church and became the head of it. To reveal to us the mind of God. To teach us the things that God wants us to know. When Jesus became flesh, it revealed to us the enormity of sin. You know, God had taught about the consequences of sin before. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, he told people very clearly that sin separates man from God. Now, that's a terrible consequence. That's, that's a terrible thing that sin does. It comes between us and our Creator. Not because of Him, but because of us. Now, how is God going to fix that problem of sin? And the answer is Jesus Christ. Jesus fixed the problem of sin. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 1, the Bible says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That sin separated us from God and made us enemies with God. And through Jesus Christ, we have peace once again with the Father. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 9. The Bible says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Remember what God told Adam and Eve in the garden about eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? If you eat of it, you'll die. And Jesus came to taste death for every man so that we wouldn't have to die spiritually, being separated from God forever and ever. And so Jesus then reveals to us the nature of God. He reveals to us the mind of God. And he reveals to us the enormity of sin. We wouldn't know any of those things if it were not for Jesus, the light of the world. Another thing that light does, though, is it guides us like a beacon. You ever been on the seashore and seen a lighthouse? They put those lights up high and make them shine bright so that people out there on those ships can see where the danger is. They can be warned about the rocks or, or, be, or, or to be alerted that safety is in this path. 
Jesus is a guiding light for us. First Peter chapter 2 and verse number 21, the Bible says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. And so Jesus then lived a life so that we can follow in his steps and be an example. He is an example to us so we can be an example to others. And we look at the light of Jesus, look at the life of Jesus, we see that guiding light. First of all, he put God's will first. Jesus said over and over again, I came not to do my will, but the will of the Father. One of those places in John chapter 5 and verse number 30, where the Bible says, Jesus says, I can of mine own self do nothing as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father with which hath sent me. Can you imagine what a different world this would be? If everybody just started doing what Jesus did and putting God's will first in their lives instead of their own, instead of fulfilling their own uh, lustful, worldly desires and saying, I'm going to do what God wants me to do, that would change the whole world. It would change the church for the better, too. A lot of places where the church is having problems, it's because people are putting their own will first instead of putting God's will first. You know, Jesus shows us how to live the way we ought to live when he preached a sermon like the Sermon on the Mount. The first part of the Sermon on the Mount, he tells us to have a good disposition. He tells us how we ought to live as part of the kingdom. In Matthew chapter 5 and verses 13 through 16, he tells us that we need to be involved in good works. It's not enough just to say the right things. We have to do good in this world if we want to be like Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26, he tells us that we have to get along with our fellow man. That makes a big difference in the way the world is too. And then in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 32, Jesus teaches that we are to strive for moral purity in our lives. Now, if we do what... Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount it would change everything it would help us be more like Jesus it would he holds up that shining light to guide us into godliness Jesus even tells us what to do to be saved isn't that a wonderful thing Jesus said his mission was to come and seek and to save that which was lost and so he didn't leave this world without telling us what to do in order to be saved. Now, of course, when Jesus was here in the flesh, the church was not yet in existence. But Jesus was preparing people for the coming of the kingdom. And he mentioned every step in the plan of salvation while he was here before it was even in effect. In Mark chapter 4 and verse number 24, he said, take heed what you hear. That's the first step in the plan of salvation. You can't be saved without hearing the gospel. And so Jesus said, take very careful care about what you hear. Of course, he taught the importance of belief, too. Uh, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Believe. Step number two in the plan of salvation. Jesus said we have to repent. Luke 13, verses 3 and 5. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Jesus said we have to confess him before men if we want him to confess us before his Father in heaven. Matthew 10, and verse 32. And then, of course, Jesus taught the necessity of being baptized. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And so Jesus then holds up that guiding light, that beacon of light, the plan of salvation to tell men what to do in order to make it through this life godly and get to heaven when this life is over. And then finally, number three, light gives us hope. You ever hear people going through a hard time talking about seeing the light at the end of the tunnel? 
What they mean is that gives me a reason to hang on. The light that Jesus brought into this world gives us a reason to hang on. You know, the worst darkness that we can conceive is the darkness of death. And yet Jesus defeats death. Jesus shines a light of hope on the idea that there is life after this life. Everything we know about life after death, Christ is the one who brought that to light. 2 Timothy 1 and verse number 10, the Bible says, But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We wouldn't know about eternal life if it weren't for Jesus. And we certainly would not have access to that eternal life except Jesus died in our place. 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 2, the Bible says, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Amen. What that tells us is right now we don't have all the answers. <coughs> People ask me about what kind of body we're going to have in heaven and what it's going to be like, and the truth is I don't know the answer to all that. But I know Jesus is going to shed light on that question. When he comes back, we're going to see him as he is, and we're going to be like him. What a blessing that is. 2 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 55 and 57. First, Paul poses this question. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? But thanks be to God, verse 57, which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to fear death. There's no more sting for the child of God because when we lay down our cares and troubles and worries here in this life, we go to be with Jesus. We go to paradise. And we don't have to worry about being separated from God through all eternity. You know, ultimately what we have to look forward to, of course, is a place in heaven prepared for all eternity, for the faithful of all the ages. You know what the Bible says about heaven? It says Jesus is the only light we need there. In Revelation chapter 21, verses 22 and 23, John says, And I saw no temple therein. He's able to look with the eye of faith up into heaven. And he says, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Jesus is not only the light of life here on this side of eternity. He's the light of heaven. And that's what we have to look forward to if we live faithfully while we're here on this earth. Yes, Jesus is the light of the world. But you know what the Bible also tells us? It tells us that we as his people are supposed to be lights in the world too. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. You're the light of the world, Jesus said. And so, I ask you this question then. Have you obeyed the gospel? Because if you haven't, you're not. Shining as a light in the world. You're not that beacon that God wants you to be. Obey the gospel before it's too late. You've already heard Jesus give you the plan of salvation. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. If you want to know more about that plan, just let me know. Walk down that aisle say you want to study, and we'll study with you so that you can leave here knowing for sure that you have done the right thing to have your sins washed away in the blood of Christ. And if you have obeyed the gospel of Christ, the question is, are you living a faithful life? 
I have to answer that question for myself just as you have to answer it for yourself. Are you being faithful unto death to receive that crown of life? Revelation 2, verse number 10. That's the only way we can hope to shine as lights in the world the way Jesus wants us to. Jesus is the light of the world, but he calls on us to follow in his steps and to shine his lights in the world around us as well. If we can help you obey the gospel, we want to, and if we can pray with you and for you in a public way because of sin, we're happy to do that as well. All you have to do is let us know of your need right now as together we stand and as we sing. I am Thank you. 